Assalamualaikum and hi, I'm Dr. Nabila from HKL NS Department. I'm truly honoured to be part of today's workshop. And I'm here to give a short talk on the Trunker Block in ED. Ever since the establishment of Regional Zone in ED last year, I think more and more the emergency doctors became aware of the importance in incorporating regional anaesthesia in, as part of the acute pain management in ED setting. So common block practice for rib fractures uh, would be the intercostal block and also the SAP block, uh, which I had highlighted during my lecture during my previous uh, workshop. Whereas for those who presented with uh, acute abdomen without any kind of surgical intervention, we would consider TAP or Codotus Lumbarum Block, also known as QLB, to alleviate the pain. However, all these blocks have its own limitation in terms of uh, the extent of the matome that being covered. So that's when the ESP, the Rectus Spinal Plane Block, came along. It is said to be one of the block with a thousand wonders. So this is going to be the outline of my talk today. We are going to talk about the indication, the ergonometry, the proposition, the sonar anatomy, needling, LA needle, and lastly, the complications of ESP block. Erectus penny plane block was described in 2016 by Ferrer et al. as part of the regional anesthetic technique to treat acute and chronic thoracic pain. Basically, it is a paraspinal fascia plane block that involves injection of LA deep to the erector spinal muscle and superficial uh, to the transverse process. So it is quite safe to perform the ESP block as it has uh, very few complications because it's quite far away from uh, the spinal cord, from the pleura, from the major blood vessels. So bit on the chest wall innovation first. Each thoracolumbar uh, spinal nerve divides into both dorsal and also ventral rami soon after emerging from the intervertebral foramen. So the, death, the dorsal rami travel, tra travel posteriorly uh, to divide into the medial and also the lateral uh, branches that innervate the tissue at the back. The T1 till T12 uh, ventral rami runs along the rib then give off uh, various branches, for example, the lateral cutaneous branch at the angle of the rib and terminate at the anterior cutaneous branch. So how does placing the LA at the tip of the transverse process cause a hemithorax analgesia? How does the block spread? So uh, there's a few postulated mechanisms. The most famous one would be because the LA penetrates anteriorly into the epidural and also the part of the vertebral space that contain the spinal nerve, uh, the dorsal rami and also the ventral rami, hence causing all the somatic and visceral energy, energesia. Another uh, theory is that because uh, the dorsal rami are being blocked when they ascend through the leg of LA uh, uh, deposited at the ESP. And then there's another theory saying that the ESP is connected laterally with the plane deep to serratus anterior muscle. And any kind of LA that travel laterally within this plane potentially can reach and anesthetize the lateral cutaneous nerve branch. So theoretically, we can perform ESP block from cervical till lumbar region, covering practically the whole trunk. Uh, there are a few examples that worth highlighting here would be the chronic shoulder pain syndrome, the rib fracture, the chronic post-hepatic neuralgia, and also the facet pain. In our ED setting, we use ESP mostly for the rib fractures. But how about the other part of the world? So here we have a few case series and maybe case reports that I managed to dig out from the Google Scholar. Uh, the one that uh, quite interesting to know is that there's a group of EPs in India recruited uh, seven patients with acute pericarditis and gave them a mixture of uh, pivacaine on top of lidocaine and also dexamethasone, making up until 30 mils and inject them at T7 level. So from the study, there is a reduction in pain score at different time uh, intervals, the side effects, and also the additional energetic dose requirement. 
So another study was uh, published in the American Journal and Emergency Medicine by the NS and also EP team from Turkey. So they decided to give an ESP block for a patient who presented with a renal colic to the emergency department. And surprise, surprise, the patient had a relief uh, from the colic. And then uh, another case series were published in the Canadian Journal of um, Emergency Medicine by the EPs from Vancouver Island. They recruited 10 patients and they decided to, uh, to give the ESP block as a novel intervention for a mechanical back pain. So how do they do that is that basically they place the probe over the spinous process of the vertebra corresponding to the maximum level of tenderness. So they use the spinal needle and they inject a pupivacin of 0.25% 20 ml each side. And then because of, of all these case studies and case report, uh, Abdel Hamid decided to uh, make a literature review on it to look at the use of erectile spinal pain block to decrease the pain and opioid consumption in the ED. So they found out that there's a quite few different indications that people use the ESP in the ED, for example, the root fractures, which is the most common one, and also the mechanical pain, the burn injuries, the herpes zoster, the renal colic, and also acute pericarditis. All the studies demonstrated that there is a significant pain reduction and also administration of the opioid. Furthermore, it has been shown to improve the respiratory function and was not associated with any kind of complication. There's this one study I want to highlight. It's not about a truncal analgesia, it's more like an upper extremity. So there's this uh, a group of EPs in Minnesota who did a erectile spinal pain block for a patient who came in with a radicular left arm pain. So they gave her a LA Ropivacin of 0.25%, 60 ml at T2 level, and patient had a complete pain relief for five days. So it shows that ESP other than can treat uh, the trunk, uh, can serve as a trunk analgesia, it is also useful to treat any kind of chronic upper extremity pain without causing any kind of motor blockade. So I think I've presented enough uh, evidence to show that ESP is useful in ED setting. So why don't we move on to the practical part? Rule of thumb for a successful block is we have to make sure that the operator and the patient is in a comfortable position. Patient can be placed in a lateral decubitus position, making sure that it is in a straight line perform a form between the operator, the injection site, and the ultrasound monitor. Patient can also be placed in a sitting manner or in a prone position as long as the patient is comfortable. So once the patient and the operator is in a perfect ergonometry, we can start scanning patients back. There's a two ways of doing it, from medial to lateral, or from lateral to medial. If we decided to scan from medial, then we need to palpate for the spinous process. The high-frequency linear probe then placed in a longitudinal paracetamol orientation and about roughly 3 cm lateral to the spinous process, we'll be able to visualize a transverse process which recognizable as a flat squared of acoustic shadows. There are three important muscles that we need to identify here, which are the trapezius muscle, the rhomboid muscle, and also the erector spinal muscles. And we have to remember that the rhomboid ends at T5. This is an important landmark as any block above the T5 block, the thorax region, and LA below the T5 will cover the abdomen area. But if let's say we want to start our scanning from a lateral instead, then the ribs will be visualized. These are recognizable as a rounded acoustic shadow with a hyperechoic pleural line. And then all we need to do is that we just need to slide our probe a bit medially till we meet the flat square of acoustic shadow again, which is the transverse process. And uh, our needle point will be in a at on top of the transverse process in implant manner and all we need to do is that we place a LA on top of it displacing the erector spinal muscle upward. So how do we know which level are we at? 
there's a few ways of doing it as well. We can do it by looking at the anatomical landmark. So we know that the vertebral prominence correspond to the C7. So we can just calculate it from the C7 level and try to get our T5 or T3, any level that we want to inject the LA at. Or we can, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, the rhomboid ends at T5. So from there, we can calculate upward or downward uh, from the T5 level. And we also can do a rip calculating or transverse process calculating in a real-time manner. So this is a video taken from a last year workshop of virtual life regional workshop, uh, demonstrating how we calculate the transverse process in a real-time manner. All we need to do is to place uh, the probe in the middle of uh, the clavicle and then start calculating the ribs. So the first rib that we can see would be the one that being pointed there, and then is the subsequent uh, ribs. With, we can see the plural line below it, and then that's our third rib there. And then now we are towards our fourth ribs, and then we can see that on top of the rib uh, there's uh, the three muscle layer. And then once we have decided which level we want to, that uh, how do we know that we are in the correct plane? So there's this one effect that we look at when we gave uh, the LA, which is called as the pumping effect. So this short video also taken by, uh, from the similar workshop last year, will explain what I meant by the pumping effect. We can see that uh, the tip of the needle is at the transverse process here. And then uh, when we try to inject the LA, there's a distension of the plane and the plane collapse when we stop giving the LA. So this proof that we are actually at the correct plane. So that is what we call as the pumping effect. So let's just look at it again. We can see that the tip is at the end here, transverse process, and the pumping effect is being observed. So a lot of people ask me about what kind of LA that we used, what volume that we give, and the concentration. So uh, most of the time, we use long-acting LA, for example, the ropivacaine, which is the maximum dose of 4 mg per kilo, or we can use a levobopivacaine, a maximum of 3 mg per kilo. We aim for a large volume in order to achieve optimal efficacy. So the minimum volume that we use be around 20 mils and maximum around maybe 40 mils each side. For the concentration wise, we have to calculate the maximum LA dose that the patient can get. So the lowest concentration that I would go would be the half and the maximum would be the two third of the maximum strength. And because this is a high volume plane block, we need to be a bit careful of the toxic dose in the bilateral block. This table actually uh, reported by Luftig et al. specifically look at the volume and concentration in 49 cases when indicated for a rib fracture as analgesia. So based on the findings, they created this uh, simple guide for ESP block in this patient. So we can see here for the unilateral block, the maximum that they give would be around 40 ml of uh, we vacuum 0.25% in 100 kilo patient. Whereas for a bilateral block, they won't advise a giving a bubivacaine of 0.5, but they would give a 30 mil of 0.25% bubivacaine. So total up, we make up to 60 mils in that patient. So I know it's a bit confusing here. So let us just do a bit of our own mathematics before we decided how much to give and what kind of concentration we want to give a particular patient. So let's say if we want to take a 70 kilo patient, we know that the maximum dose that the patient can get is a 70 by 4, which is around 280 milligram. So we, know, we also know that the Rupivacin 0.75% is the maximum strength of the Rupivacin and 0.75% is actually equals to 7.5 milligram per mil. If I decided to give a 30 mil for this patient, so I multiply it with the two-third of uh, the maximum strength, which is the 5 milligram, 
and it only equals up to 150 milligram. So kind of like to say it's quite safe to give a two-third at maximum strength. So since it's quite far away from the maximum toxic dose, you can give this patient of 40 mils for the unilateral block and it's actually quite safe as well. So let's say if we take a smaller patient, a 40 kilo patient, so the Ropivacaine maximum dose would be just around 160 milligram, which is quite small. So for a unilateral block, we can, if we want to give a 30 mils for that side of block, a 5 milligram uh, or concentration of a Ropivacaine 0.5 would nearly reach the toxic dose. So would I give a 30 mils of 0.5% of Ropivacaine? Yes, I would give because it's still less than the toxic dose. But what if patient require a bilateral block? Then this is when the calculation have to kick in. We might need to reduce uh, the volume and also the concentration of uh, the ropivacaine before performing the block in order to not to reach the toxic dose. So how about the needle? To perform a regional anesthesia, ideally we need to have an echogenic block needle. So the common one in the market would be Stimuplex and Sonoplex. The length will have to depend on the depth in the sonar anatomy, but a maximum in the Asian people would be around 120 mm and the minimum one would be around 80 mm. And uh, for ESP, it's actually advisable to insert a catheter in to prolong the analgesia. So there's a tool I think available in our hospital right now is catheter through needle or catheter over needle. The example for the catheter through needle would be the epidural catheter. And the simplest example for a catheter over needle would be the branula, the normal branula. So what is the pro and cons between these two catheters is that for a catheter through needle, after the needle withdrawal, there is potential leakage around the needle insertion site. So because of the space created by the needle puncture, so we tend to avoid using the catheter through needle. And if we use the catheter over needle, the skin forms a tight seal around the catheter after the needle withdrawal, which is a good thing for us because there's no LA leakage from there. So last but not least, uh, even though I mentioned earlier on that the complication is very rare in ESP block, but these are the things that we need to highlight to the patient when we are taking consent from the patient. For example, the infection part, the last, the puncture from the vascular, the pleura, the pneumothorax and also the possibility of a block. So the take home message here is that the ESP block is a simple technique with a lot of applications. It's a very efficacious comparable to other trunk block with a generous margin, margin of safety but we have to remember that we have to weigh the risk and benefits of our alternative as well and we have to always consider a multimodal energy. With that, I thank you.